Welcome to Lesson 3F, Rigid Body Rotation. In this lesson, we'll discuss the behavior of a liquid that's in a container that's rotating at some constant rotational speed. And we'll do an example problem. First, some physics. Consider a container of liquid with radius r spinning at some constant angular velocity. The angular velocity vector is straight up in these problems. And we're rotating about the z-axis. Little r is the radius. Let's consider some small element of this fluid at radius r1. From the previous lesson for linear acceleration, we had this equation. Gradient of p equal rho times gravity vector minus acceleration vector. And we called this a modified gravity vector, capital G. So gradient p is rho times capital G vector. We can still apply this equation in this rotating case, but keep in mind that capital G is not a constant, since the direction of the acceleration is constantly changing as this thing rotates around. However, a always points to the center of rotation. In other words, a is a centripetal acceleration. The magnitude of this acceleration is r omega squared, since the liquid is rotating in a constant RPM. Imagine a camera moving with this little fluid particle as it spins around. What would we see? We would see acceleration a towards the middle, and we would also have our gravity acting. So if our camera is moving with this little element of fluid, we would see a steady acceleration to the left. And we can analyze this in exactly the same way that we did in the previous lesson. In other words, vectorially sum g minus a. Here's g, here's a, so here's minus a. We complete the parallelogram to get capital G, the modified gravity vector. The fluid particle feels a modified gravity vector as sketched. The isobars will be perpendicular to this modified gravity vector, just as they were for the case of linear acceleration. Now repeat this for any value of radius r. I'll sketch this on the next page. At the center of rotation where r equals 0, there's no centripetal acceleration, so the isobars are just flat, since a equals 0, capital G equals little g. At some other radius, the isobars are tilted perpendicular to the local g. At an even larger radius, since the magnitude of a is bigger, capital G will also be bigger and will be tilted more to the right. We can keep doing this for all radii. Remember, we're rotating around the z-axis, and we're examining various values of r. I'll summarize this qualitatively. Qualitatively, the bigger is radius r. The bigger is acceleration a, the centripetal acceleration towards the middle. Therefore, as r increases, the magnitude of g increases, and vector g tilts more to the right, where we're considering the right side of this rotating container. There's symmetry on the left side, of course, where g would point to the left. Putting all this together, if we consider these top isobars as the surface, so that all these elements we're talking about are on the surface of the liquid, we can sketch a smooth curve, as shown. The pressure is atmospheric pressure everywhere along this liquid surface, so p equal p atmosphere there. When you do the math, this surface is the shape of a paraboloid, which is a parabola that is rotated around in a circle. That's called a paraboloid. This free surface is also an isobar since it's a surface of constant pressure. What about other isobars? Well, we haven't said anything about the depth of the fluid element that we're examining, so we could repeat this analysis for fluid particles at any z and r location. It turns out that the isobars are also paraboloids. They're just lower in the tank. I'll resketch it. This is the free surface paraboloid, which is an isobar. If we go a little deeper, the lower isobars have the exact same shape. They're just shifted lower. Even if you go through the bottom of the container, the isobars continue across as shown. Let's define the depth at the center as hc. You can see the text for the full derivation. I'll just give the result here. It turns out that zs, the equation of the free surface as a function of r, is equal to omega squared r squared over 2g plus hc, where hc is the depth from the center line of the paraboloid to the bottom of the tank. And z here is relative to the bottom of the tank. Any other isobar has the same equation, but it's just shifted downward. So z isobar is omega squared r squared over 2g, the same value here, plus some c1, where c1 is not a constant, rather it increases with depth. For this particular isobar, for example, this elevation would be the magnitude of c1. c1 itself is a negative number. It's the depth from from the free surface to the particular isobar in question, but it's a negative value so that z of the isobar is lower than z of the surface as it must be. So to solve these types of problems, if we know the radius of the container and we know the angular velocity omega rotating about the z-axis, we can calculate the shape of all of these isobars. Height hc is of course determined by how much liquid is in this container. 
If you put in more liquid, it'll just shift everything up. You can do some fun calculations to figure out at what RPM liquid will spill out. Or alternatively, for a constant omega, what volume of water can you put in this container before it starts spilling out over the edge? Let's do an example. We have a container of water spinning at some rotation rate. We give it an RPM. We give the radius of the container and HC. In this problem, we want to calculate the elevation distance delta Z, which is shown here, between the water surface at the center and at the rim. The first thing I do, and this is very critical, is to convert from n dot in RPM to omega in radians per second. 100 RPM is 100 rotations per minute. There are 2 pi radians per rotation and 1 minute per 60 second. Now we apply our equation for the free surface of the liquid. The desired distance is delta z, which is z at the surface at r equal capital R, minus z at the surface at the center line r equals 0. So this equation gives us Delta Z is omega squared R squared over 2G plus HC. That's the first term. Minus omega squared R squared over 2G plus HZ. But R equals 0 here. So this term goes away. And this is the second term. The HCs also cancel out. So our answer in variable form is omega squared R squared over 2G. We plug in the numbers and get delta Z equal omega squared times capital R squared over 2 times g and 1 unity conversion factor. I don't square this since we want our answer in centimeters. Radian has no units or dimensions, so the only thing left here is centimeters, and our answer is 6.83 centimeters. My student, Joe's student, will demonstrate with a rotating container on a motor, which is advertised as rotating at 100 RPM, but it really goes a little bit slower than that. Okay, Joe, show the demo. Okay, dude, let's turn this baby on. We speed up the video while everything settles down. Seems to be steady rotation now, dude. Yeah, that's about 6.3 or so centimeters. Awesome, dude. So you can see the nice paraboloid that we formed, and the agreement was pretty close, but not perfect since the RPM was a little less than 100 RPM. Finally, let's look at a couple applications. Notice that density does not appear in this equation. In other words, the density of this liquid doesn't matter. In terms of the surface shape, the density of the liquid will, of course, influence the pressure throughout the liquid. In the vertical direction, pressure increases linearly like in hydrostatics. But the surface shape is independent of density. With that, we can do an application. Suppose we use mercury as our liquid. People actually create parabolic mirrors without having to grind or polish the glass by using a liquid and just rotating it. You can imagine this would have to have very good bearings and rotate at a constant speed, but you get a nice parabolic shape. And liquid mercury is very reflective, so we have a parabolic mirror. The only problem is that it always points straight up. In astronomy, we call the point straight up from the Earth the zenith. So this telescope is called the Large Zenith Telescope. This one is located in Canada. If you don't want to limit yourself to looking straight up, you can do the same thing with molten glass and then let it harden. If you do this very carefully, you get a really nice parabolic glass shape. And they make mirrors out of this as well. You can actually see a honeycomb substructure underneath this glass. That's for structural support and also so that you don't need as much glass. It turns out that you get the same surface shape regardless of the container. You don't need to fill this entire container with glass. Instead, you can have a container already shaped approximately like what you want. And you can get the same free surface with just this much liquid glass with a honeycomb structure of support. That's how they actually make these kinds of mirrors. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.